reaching my my full potential without feeling overstretched myself. I guess that's the kind of philosophy of life work. And I think there is something really powerful about children seeing their mums do that, children seeing their dads do that. And that would probably be more powerful than anything specifically that I can indoctrinate them with through my language with them. I think it kind of speaks for itself that I will prioritize work my own activities as well and it's it's all it's got to work for the whole family it's not all at the expense of the parents and their interests this is life work with Maya where we talk about success on your terms and tune in to work and lives that feel spacious abundant and aligned with who we truly are So we've had a few episodes now which are quite content rich. I've shared a lot of personal experience. Um, They're quite dense and they've got a bit of a focus on Q4 and health goals and things like that. So definitely go and have a listen back to those, but I'm going to change it up a bit this week and I'm going to answer a question that's come to me via Instagram. Just a reminder, do send me questions via Instagram or via LinkedIn and I will do my best to answer them on the podcast. So I'm going to read this question out and I'm also going to decipher it a bit because it's a pretty um, involved question, but I think it's really cool and it's got some cool dimensions to it. So have you ever thought about doing an episode on how to not put the stresses of work, time commitments, and your desire for your kids to reach their full potential without feeling overstretched, how to not put this stuff onto your kids, right? It's something that I was struggling with this morning, so I thought I'd get in touch. So thank you so much for sharing this question with me. And I'm going to break it down a little bit. And the first thing I'm going to say is that um, this is really interesting when I think about the parallels with leadership at work and some of the topics that come up in leadership at work. So the first thing, which is very much something I talk about with clients at work, is individualization. So if you're a leader at work and you've got a team, um, what you don't probably want to be doing um, in our new lens and our new model of empowered leadership, where we really empower and bring out people's strengths and all of that, you probably don't want to do be doing a one size fits all, right? So you want to really understand the different personality dynamics going on within your team and the different motivations, uh, what motivates different team members and what drives them. This is why I love, by the way, doing the Hogan with my leaders because it helps them really understand their own motivations, how those look different from their team's motivations and how they look different and what the different personality profiles are in their team and therefore what behaviors they're likely to see in their teams. Because from that perspective, they can therefore start tailoring their styles accordingly. And likewise, with our kids, it's not going to be one size fits all. So let's say you have a highly sensitive child, or let's say you have a child that is so super laid back that they're practically horizontal, or let's say you've got a high achieving girl, or let's say that you've got somebody that is displaying, you know, early signs of anxiety, like skin picking or something like that, right? These are all different um, descriptions of children. Some of them are things that have come my way and they're all going to warrant slightly different approaches. And what I say here, which is probably the departure from leadership in the workplace, is that like to the mom or the dad, you know, you are the expert of your own child. So I remember um, being in a ballet class um, when my daughter was very young, like three, and being told that I just needed to dump her off and then walk away. And that was going to be the best way for her to engage. And I at that point, I I just knew that that wasn't going to work for her. It's actually going to turn her off the whole experience and turn it into a disaster, right? But I was receiving um, a signal from, I was receiving a message, clear message from the teacher that there was a one size fits all approach there. Um, And I could see the disaster unfolding. And I I think my my memory is hazy, but I think I did sort of apologetically say, I I just know that's not going to work. Do you mind if I stay here? And then I move there and then I gradually phase myself out. So 
I just like with health, we are like our own best experts and we have to advocate for our own um, our own health. I think when it comes to our kids, like we are the experts of our kids. We're not all psychologists. We're not all briefed in all of the different aspects, but we can learn as much as possible about our kids, especially if they are like a little bit more extreme on one front or another. We can learn about what it is that kind of motivates them, upsets them um, and really, really tune in to those little signs um, that exist in our kids. So, you know, there are things that if my son says, I know he's not okay. And I know that he is very, in his very little voice, um, basically kind of asking for help and, and signaling to me that he's not okay. Whereas my daughter, for example, will be screaming the house down if she's not okay. Uh, so just kind of understanding these subtle signals, I think is so critical because, um, depending on how sensitive they are, depending on what motivates them, depending on, you know, how much external approval and validation they need, it's going to really impact the way that you then want to be managing them and, and working with them. And therefore, in the example of this question, let's say we wanted our child to reach their full potential without feeling overstretched. Um, and we knew that they are a super laid back child and not very um, motivated by external validation. We may need to take a slightly punchier approach to motivating them and really give them the kind of the consequences and the hard facts. Whereas if we've got a very sensitive um, child, and I was about to say the word girl because I do feel like there are certain stats around, you know, girls as they kind of grow up and stuff and how um, how their confidence can be impacted. But let's say you you have that instead, you may want to uh, very, you know, you may want to tailor your message accordingly. You know, for example, the classic tests and test results, if you know that they might, they might be very, very sensitive to, um, you know, not, not having a perfect score, they might be a bit perfectionist, you want to really tailor your language. So one thing I know, having gone to um, a girls' school, a high-achieving girls' school, is that I always make sure that my language is um, around like good enough and 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 maybe excellence, but not never perfection and never ever um, wanting to achieve academically in in perfect ways. Um, so that's just something that I picked up. I've picked up a lot around that in terms of the impacts that it can have uh, on girls and stuff. And so it's a message that I've just chosen to emphasise um, with, especially with my daughter. But I think what is crucial here in this kind of individualization piece is that, you know, as as parents today, we are bombarded with loads of different approaches. And I think it's just really important that we know uh, what what we what is important for us and what is important when it comes to our individual kids and their personality styles. Okay, the next piece. So we've got individualization. The next piece for me is be real. And so again, this comes up with my leaders. So we talk about vulnerability and role modeling vulnerability. And then we realize often that my leaders, they're not role modeling vulnerability. In fact, they're often standing in the way because they feel that they bear that responsibility of managing all the crap from above and then not, not kind of and being and almost protecting their team. So then they become this um, masked a leader because they have to hold it together and they have to hold all of the uncertainty, toxicity and chaos above and present this sort of calm face uh, to their teams. But actually sometimes that's not helpful because that can wear thin, the um, frustrations can actually come through and that's even worse. And many times now I've worked with leaders to say, actually, why don't we try a slightly different approach, which is actually to be more upfront where we can be, be more real, explain where we've got control, where we've not got control, but then really emphasize that despite the difficult circumstances that we as the leader are there to support them and reassure them in all the different ways that we can reassure them. So it's really occupying then the kind of the hopes and fears of their team members when they sit there. They don't want to see a plastic face. They don't want to see a mask face. They want to see something real. They don't want to see this person that's sort of wearing thin because of all the stuff going on above, but who's not willing to convey any of that. And so actually what you get is even a, a, a more um, filtered, approach and, you know, non-transparent approach, which people can kind of pick up on. And likewise, I feel, you know, as a parent that my approach, at least, because I spend a lot of time with my kids, my approach has been, I can't be masked. I have to 
be able to be myself. So I have to be able to share when I'm happy and sad and stressed and not stressed. And I need to be able to do that. Likewise, if I think I've said something inappropriate or wrong, or I've gotten angry or something like that, I am very quick to leap in and say, I'm so sorry, actually, I'm not really happy with, with how that came out and, um, and talk it through them and really demonstrate that I'm, I'm more than happy to go back on something that's come out in the heat of a moment and update it just like in the workplace when I talk to the lead, to my leaders to say, look, if you, if something's come out wrong, if you've been sort of pushed over the edge on something and feel like you lost your temper and you're not happy with that, you can go back and you can say, actually, I'm not happy with how, how that came out. This is probably the reason why it was, you know, there's a couple of things building up here, but that wasn't okay. I'm not happy with, I'm really sorry. And actually what I meant to say was this, and I'm wondering if we could perhaps have a conversation around why. Um, so again, I think sort of the 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 need to perhaps protect, just like we want to protect our team sometimes, the need to sort of protect our kids from everything um, can actually create more stress and strain. So my second lens and principle is, you know, find ways to be yourself, right? Find ways to let them know, yeah, that you you do have, um, you know, stressful work and, and that work can feel like a lot sometimes and that, you know, mommy or daddy just needs a little bit of time now because work has been full on and just needs to recharge. Just like sometimes you might want a screen um, to relax. Mommy just needs a little bit of time or daddy needs just needs a little bit of time to unwind. My, my husband is quite good about, he's sort of enforced this weekend morning time where he'll do pancakes on a Sunday morning. Um, but then once they've had their pancakes, cakes and all the nice treats that go with that, the Nutella and all of that stuff, they know it's quiet time. And then they know that he's going to be sitting there and having his moment with, with his newspapers. Um, and that is quiet time. And, um, you know, uh, it's just an example of how, um, it's, it's not a front that has to be put on all the time. So, so I would say that is the second point is finding ways to be really real, you know, not feel like you have to endlessly protect. That said, I remember reading something about how it's not children's responsibilities to have to in any way rescue their parents or look after them or, you know, that type of thing. And putting that kind of burden on them is not okay. So it's not okay to say, well, because of you, you know, I'm I'm miserable or whatever it is. Like we're not trying to um, place emotional burden on our kids. So I guess that's the fine line that we want to walk. We want to be able to share with them um, in a way that feels like we don't have to hold everything back and put a front on and we can be our natural happy selves and not not pent up or passive aggressive or holding it all together because that's just impossible in a in this long term endeavor that we are um, in as parents. Um, but also recognizing we're not putting burden on them. So that's the caveat, I guess. Um, all right, what is my third point? I have a third point. Okay, so as part of my third point, I actually wanted to take each of the different options uh, in turn. So there was stresses of work. So I've talked about that a little bit, like you don't want to put the stresses of your work onto your kids. And so you might need to, as I've explained, you might want to say things like, look, I just need a little bit of time here. That's my relaxation time. And I think it can be really healthy for kids to see um, that parents have their own coping mechanisms and ways to unwind. Um, or, you know, you say, well, actually, I'm kind of at my limit now because I've had a really busy day. So I I'm going to really need you to, when I ask you to help clear up the table, just do it once and so that they can understand why. So I do think that communication can help. So we've kind of touched on that one already. The next one, time commitment. So not wanting to put the stress of time commitments onto your kids. Now, there's going to be so many different ways to answer this and I might miss miss the main point um, because I, I don't have further information about those time commitments, whether they are the parents' time commitments or the kids' time commitments. But I think there's maybe something a little bit deeper here first, which is, is there, are there too many time commitments? You know, is there too many things on the plate? And is that a problem? Like, does that need to be looked at? Yes, sometimes schedules can get busy, right? They can get quite intense. Um, I probably have a point of view here, which is, you know, in line with the whole spaciousness thing, which is that I don't like to overschedule myself, my kids. Um, so I am quite cautious around time commitments. Um, and so I think if they're 
are too many time commitments, then that will impact a child. Like it's impossible for it not to. Um, of course, there are ways to manage it. So if you're conscious that they've perhaps got a fuller day, then perhaps there's fewer pressures for them to do other things and they can really, you know, lean into their downtime and, and have whatever relaxation they need. Um, but I do, I do really like open space for kids. And I do think that there are phases of life which are super busy, but overall it can be really nice to build some of that stuff in and kind of allow for shit time commitments um, to to not get too intense. So again, not knowing more about the question um, and there could be another layer to those time commitments, but I do think that part of life work and planning is taking that time to look at schedules, look at our schedule, look at the kids' schedules, really test those, make sure that they're not um, uh, overworked. I know for me right now, just giving personal examples, uh, my daughter's asked to do more gymnastics and I'm not saying no to her, but I just want her to understand that this time last year, she was fine um, at the start of term, but by the middle and past half term, and there was some concerts coming up and things, she was feeling it. And what I don't want is that she's then signed up to that and then it all gets a little bit too much. So I just want to gently remind her about that before we take on um, that extra commitment for her. Um, and the other thing is, as, as two working parents, we have to be really careful. There are so many things I'd love my kids to do, but I'm just aware that we we're quite we just don't have the time to be running around and that would be stressful for the kids. So what we try and do is we try and be geographically savvy. So we restrict their activities to mainly being in certain areas because we just I'm this is life work. So the idea is that you don't take something on that puts everything else out of balance. If you take on an activity that's an hour drive away, uh, then that impacts a whole chunk of time. And that does have a, a disproportionate impact then um, on other things. And so uh, we've found ways to really minimize that stuff. And I know that that is not everybody's approach and I'm not advocating that it should be. I am just sharing that that has been one thing that has minimized one of the pressures of time commitments, I guess, um, uh, on the kids and on, on us as, as parents, because we don't want to be endlessly running around. And one nice way of doing that has been leaning into seasonal stuff. So I've talked before about swimming and the fact that we haven't done that, year, you know, all year round, but we just lean heavily into it at the right times of the year and give it that real kind of intensive push. Instruments, for example, like the kids each are now learning an instrument. And during term time, I just don't think they get enough time. But during the long summer holidays, it was the perfect opportunity for them to spend a bit more time with their instruments. But they're still at an age where they're not going to do that independently. So I would sit with them. I would sit with my son and he quite liked that. He quite liked the attention and he'd seen me doing it with my old, with his older sister and he wanted that. So uh, I think, again, like there's, there's times for things. There's times you can lean into different activities um, at different times of the year without having to do all the things all the time. And that can ease things. Again, I think I'm veering off the question a little bit because I think it's more important to actually manage the time commitments rather than may maybe just um, not putting the pressure of those time commitments onto the kids. So that's my way of answering that one. I think the only thing to say is when it's completely unavoidable, like maybe there's some family stuff going on uh, on top of birthday parties and and all of those things. If it happens to be a busy weekend, I will just kind of talk them through it and give them a bit of a heads up and say, look, this is what's going on so that they are mentally prepared for it. Because one thing I noticed after COVID was that my daughter was less up for rushing around. And so she actually does like a slightly uh, more relaxed pace than she used to. Likewise, I think this final bit, you know, the, the desire for your kids to reach their full potential, but not to feel overstretched, etc. I think that's so interesting, isn't it? And I, again, probably my question is more around that desire for your kids to reach their potential. And what, what does that mean? Why is that important? And I know, as I ask that, you might be thinking, well, of course, that's important. Isn't that what every parent wants. My personal philosophy is that my kids are who they are in all senses, in terms of their personality, in terms of their 
capabilities uh, in terms of their strengths, their weaknesses, things that come easily to them, things that don't. And my job as a parent is to support them in all of those things, like it's to support them the best I can to be as comfortable as they can with all of their different things. Um, So it's maybe not so much about reaching their full potential as it is about enabling and supporting the different interests that they have, the different challenges that they are bringing um, and that sort of thing. And I think if they feel super supported and enabled, then the rest will come. So an example was that when my daughter was younger, she, she was pretty good at gymnastics, but then as part of her squad training she had a teacher that was a little bit stricter than (laughs) I think she was used to having I don't think she has very strict teachers at school and he scared her he intimidated her and so she decided she didn't want to do gymnastics anymore and I felt like that wasn't necessarily the right reason to quit and I went and had a chat with him in front of her like with her where she was sort of standing there sort of like crying while I sort of had this sensitive conversation where I didn't want to upset the teacher and say look you know, um, she's struggling with the kind of the the tone and style, but trying to find a middle ground. And um, afterwards, I had a chat with my daughter who had absorbed the whole conversation just to kind of explain what my approach had been. I didn't want to antagonize him, but I just wanted him to know that perhaps it was affecting her a little bit. And, you know, just to kind of smooth, smooth things in a certain direction, because I wanted her to see the advocacy that I was, that I was advocating for her. Um, and she then persisted with the gymnastics. And every now and then I remind her, I was like, well, just remember you, you actually wouldn't be going to this anymore because if we listened to only your point of view, then you would have stopped by now. And that's actually quite useful for my son to hear as well, because he will fall in and love in and out of love with activities as well. So he's been doing some football that he'd wanted to stop. And I just give him that example and say, look, this is this is how it's turned out. Look at her now. She's absolutely thriving in her gymnastics, loves it so much, wants to do even more. But perhaps if we had just kind of listened to her, then she wouldn't be doing it. And so that's the kind of support I want to give them. I just want to really walk that line, really understand the rationale. If she told me that it was for some other reason that felt like actually a really good justification then perhaps I would have, you know, gone with it. But in that instance, it was sort of about making the call. So for me, I think perhaps the desire is less about the reaching. I'm concerned with reaching my own full potential, frankly, and I want my kids to see me reaching my own full potential. And that to me is the best role modeling and the best um, way for them to understand that I am reaching reaching my my full potential without feeling overstretched myself. I guess that's the kind of philosophy of life work. And I think there is something really powerful about children seeing their mums do that, children seeing their dads do that. And that would probably be more powerful than anything specifically that I can indoctrinate them with through my language with them. I think it kind of speaks for itself that I will prioritize work, my own activities as well. And it's, it's all, it's got to work for the whole family. It's not all at the expense of the parents and their interests. And in fact, the parents have, you know, really strong interests and the kids see that and they see the benefit of having those interests, I would like to think. So that's a bit of an answer. I'm very interested what the listener thinks. Um, Perhaps she'll provide me some more information in case I've gone off the mark in certain parts of the question. But I do think that the parallel between parenting and leadership is really interesting in that question. And I do think there are some interesting questions there about how we view our roles as parents. I'm a coach, so naturally I want to sort of facilitate others to bring out the best in themselves, but I'm not going to do it for them. I want them to figure it out for themselves. I don't want to give them the answers quite. So I guess there's a sort of facilitation. I see myself as a facilitator and depending on the child, I will flex the ways that I, um, you know, try to motivate them um, because I have tried to understand their different personalities and what, what is, what works for them and what doesn't and appreciate that will also change over time as well. Great. 
I, I look forward to reconnecting with you next time. I believe that will be November. And so I look forward to coming with some new content for our month of November. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to Life Work with Maya. If you've got to this point, I'm guessing you found it valuable. So do share the link with somebody else who can benefit. In an age of materialism and us trying to stay on top of clutter, what could be nicer than to send a non-clutter digital link to somebody and say, I listened to this and I thought you might love it. What a great way to show your care and consideration for them. If you haven't left a review, now is the time and make sure that you are subscribed on Spotify or you're following along on Apple Podcasts. And if you really want to help the show grow, then do share the link on IG stories, Instagram stories, or reshare or discuss your thoughts with my LinkedIn posts. You can find me on LinkedIn and Instagram. Do you feel free to send me messages there? I love having dialogue with my listeners um, and the links to those handles are in the show notes. Thanks for listening and I look forward to connecting with you next time. Bye-bye.